All right, we're back, guys. Welcome back to the PH4 Developer Summit. Um, welcome to the next session. What's the difference between a drone and a flying robot by Tully Food, Community and Business Development Manager for Open Robotics? I'm really excited for this one. Uh, I gotta say that I'm a big fan of Tully. Sorry, I'm a fan. <laughs> um, he's been doing awesome work uh, on the Ross side, and the Ross community. I want to say something quickly about the Ross community. Let me just go back to my live there, okay? Hey, hi, if you're joining here from the Ross community, welcome. We want you here. Uh, we want to interact with you. Please let us know if there's anything we can do to make your life easier as a Ross developer. There's nothing better to us than having other commu fellow community members join our community, try to uh, set up our stuff, uh, run our tutorials. Let us know if there's anything that's not sure it's not clear uh, we're always on slack trying to help you out um, we're really going uh, doing a lot of effort to get make sure that Ross compatibility is up to date and uh, working really good out of the box so um, having said that uh, welcome everyone from the Ross community I'm gonna get the mic back to Tuli um, Tuli you're still here thank you again for sticking with us uh, live stream right Thank you, Tuli, for sticking with us. Um, of course. Now, go back to you. I'm going to move my mic now. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, so, as Ramon mentioned, I'm Tully Foote from Open Robotics. My role is the Community and Business Development Manager here. Uh, I've been doing robotics for my whole career, but uh, flying has had a special place in my heart all along. Uh, my grandfather was a pilot and loved building model airplanes. Uh, he flew a lot of passive gliders and was an early adopter of remote control back when it was highly advanced to have a single servo. And it was just pure analog control from a joystick in your hand. Um, I caught the bug, blazed my own path to becoming a helicopter pilot instead. I've built a hovercraft, I've flown drones, had a lot of fun. So um, I have the title, what's the difference between a drone and a flying robot? Um, I wanted to use this to inspire thoughts and discussions within the community and thinking about how to connect outside of this community and et cetera. Uh, as Lorenz mentioned, Ross has been a component of the PX4 ecosystem for a long time. We've been collaborating on projects from the early days back at ETH Zurich. And there are a lot of tools in Ross that you can leverage in this community. I'm gonna highlight some of those, but I also wanna take this opportunity to challenge you, the community to think even bigger. Ross is but one large project out there with lots of resources, but there are many more. Um, and a lot of this comes from our mission at Open Robotics, which is to facilitate open source robotics, which includes drones. And there's also a much, much larger community out there um, of projects, et cetera, that we can all leverage. Uh, just a bit of background on Open Robotics ourselves. We have a team spread around the world working on all sorts of projects, cars, drones, etc. cetera. Um, lots of fun stuff. Specifically, we have two main projects that we work on here at Open Robotics. Uh, the ROS project, the robot operating system, and Ignition Gazebo now. Um, these are two large projects. They have arch into many, many types of robots. Uh, have a huge community around the world. Uh, but we're happy to be pushing forward to getting these into the next generation. Uh, many of you are familiar with Gazebo and Ross. They've been going, both of them have been going for well over a decade. And we are pushing into Ignition Gazebo, which is the next generation of Gazebo. And Ross 2 is out and ready to go. Um, speaking of which, we have just released Ross 2 Foxy Fitzroy. This is our second LTS release of ROS2. And this is the one where we really think that it's time for people to pick up the torch and start carrying ROS2 as um, the primary mantle to think about what you're doing for ROS versus ROS2. We're ready to say it's time to switch forward. And ROS2 is being driven by Open Robotics, but we are actually now a small component of the ecosystem. You can see here the logos of our TSC. Um, oh, wait, I should be presenting, shouldn't I? Sorry. Now you can see the logos of the TSC. Um, <clears throat> these are lots of 
uh, companies from all around the world using ROS2 in many different environments. And um, we're happy to have them all coming on board now. So to give you a sense of scale of what's happening in the ROS community, we have well over 300 companies, many of them big, some of them small, many small as well. Um, I looked at the numbers for last year and we had over 260 million binary downloads of our Debian packages. We have 35,000 users on our Q&A forums, 5,000 users on our disco discourse instance. We have over 2,000 repositories indexed and we've got hundreds of thousands monthly visits on our websites. And if you're doing research, there's also over 7,000 citations of our first paper from 2009. Um, it's a great community. I encourage you all to get out and explore it. I'll give you some highlights here, but I'm really just gonna be able to gloss the surface in this quick presentation. So now, onto my main topic. If you take a look at this picture, I'm gonna say, how many of you can see a duck? facing the left, and how many of you see a rabbit facing to the right? Good news is, in my survey of everyone that I saw raise their hands, um, it's a tie, and you can see it either way. Um, so really, this is a matter of perspective. And some people see it one way, some people see it the other way, and depending on where you're coming from, what your perspective is, um, you can see it from either, either way. Uh, a lot of the PX4 community is coming from a microcontroller side. A lot of general robotics is coming from a large microprocessor side. And when you look at the problems, they have, they're the same problem, but you attack them in different ways, et cetera. And the goal of this talk is to have you become aware of your perspective. And your perspective is not wrong, but sometimes it's valuable to be able to think about what the other side is. So um, if you can't be aware of how the other side sees things and approaches things, you're basically going through your project and might be basically thinking about it with blinders on and there's other valuable approaches. So when you're thinking about these projects and when you're approaching something, you want to be able to think about what are your unique constraints? What are you sharing? What can you share? And what can you leverage from the rest of the community? There's the ROS community leverage, there's greater open source uh, computer systems and other projects that have lots of great things to take advantage of. Um, and this talk, I'm gonna be focused on practical open source. There's a lot of talks about philosophy of open source. Um, and I'd love to talk more about that, but with limited time, I think that because this is an open source community already, I'm gonna skip that and leave that as an exercise to the reader already. So <clears throat> there are many ethos of global open source communities. Uh, with Ross, we've really worked on making sure that we can have federation, um, simple, small composer utilities following the Linux community, uh, Linux model, and we don't want to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of content that we are um, out there, and if we can leverage the pre-existing things, we don't have to rewrite it. So we're looking for ways to produce, improve our efficiency and reduce our effort to be able to get the same results. Um, if two of us work together, uh, we can do twice as much work. If there's 100 of us, we can get 100 times farther. And there may be some overlap and inefficiencies in how much we can share. So we may not get a hundred times more work, but if we can only get 50% overlap or improvement, that means that we are, um, we'll still be 50 times more efficient. So <clears throat> if everyone shares a little bit, the network gets bigger and everyone benefits. So specifically, I wanna call out reuse. And this is when you can take advantage of what other people have done. And on the other side, they're sharing, which is the flip side, because if you can take advantage of the work I done, I, I've done, I need to share it back to you. And obviously these are great things to do. Uh, they're not all perfectly positive, 
We want, there are costs that you need to be able to verify the stuff that you're gonna reuse. If I share something with you and it's not up to the quality expanders that you want, it can be a lot of work for you to test and improve it to make sure it meets your standards. And so we wanna be clear about our communication and make sure we're sharing those things um, in ways that can be leveraged effectively. And similarly, there's extra cost to sharing. I wanna go through a little bit more polish to make sure to communicate to you that it works, better, works as well as you would expect it to work. And it's not always true that you should share everything. Um, there are things that are unique to certain situations. And if this thing is useful only to me, the effort to share it may not be right to do. It may not make sense because I'm gonna spend effort, effort, extra effort to share it. And then um, it's not useful to you because it's unique to me. But the important thing is when you're looking at these things is make sure to remember to avoid the not invented here syndrome where you don't think about something because you didn't think about it. So we're a little tight on time. I'm gonna speed things up and blitz through the rest of this. Um, but there are a lot of things in the latest ROS2 release and I'm just gonna highlight a handful of them here and remind you again, don't think about the challenge of not invented here. There are many things out there, they're done, they're done well, find them and take advantage of them. Looking at ROS2, uh, one of the things that I think would be super valuable to drones is that they get larger and become systems of systems. We gotta start thinking about more about multiple process launching. There are tools out there for that. Don't reinvent those. Topics, communication. There are a lot of things out there, standard messages that can be leveraged and are already used by a large community. Uh, don't reinvent these things. And if you're interested, I'm also still working on Rep 147, a standards interface for aerial vehicles. Love to get more buy-in and input on that from this community. And in addition, when you're doing this communication, there are lots of things like quality of service, which will help you with urgency and reliability over limited bandwidth link, as well as authentication, encryption, and access control. There are tools out there. Don't reinvent them. Um, if you need to visualize 3D data, arbitrary data, you may not know what's in your payload. You want to be able to ex be expandable and add new data types or new sensors quickly. There are tools for that. Uh, bag files are really valuable. They let you collect arbitrary data, keep it in a self-documenting way, play them back. It can be used for machine learning and training, unit tests, facilitating collaboration with people that cannot fly with you, and also relatively easily used for black box recordings where you can keep track of everything that goes on. Uh, there are lots of things as we start to scale up to more vehicles, more base stations, asynchronous and synchronous remote request procedures. There are lots of tools for that as well. Um, I, this was mentioned in some of the earlier talks. We have tools for keeping track of transforms and environments. One of the things I'd love to see a little bit more is parameterized templates for drone descriptions so that we can uh, simplify the launching process and coordination of standardized drone platforms. There's a ton of moving and planning infrastructure out there and projects doing these things. Um, I'd love to see more integration with the PX4 community in these areas. In particular, I wanna call out MoveIt. And SLAM and navigation. There's a whole lot of research in this area. Drones are somewhat different and somewhat unique, but don't discount everything else that's already happened. And of course, simulation, there's a lot of it out there. I'm happy to say this is something that's already been moderately well integrated into the PX4 community. Uh, to highlight this, one of the things that I talked about last year, I put out a call for input on what people would like to see in a drone playground. And I'm happy to say that we have now landed the results of that in the PX4's main SIDL branch. And if I press play, you can see the results of this. This is our best realistic um, simulation of the Baylands Park here in Sunnyvale, California. The trees are as close to accurate as possible. You can run into them. There are um, playgrounds, swing sets, the statues, everything is accurately texture mapped. The trees are as close as possible to the real world. If you are using cute ground control, you'll see the exact same thing from um, 
that's this realistic overhead data with the ground. So, and lastly, just to drop a mention of this, uh, there's micro ROS, which is coming along and looking at the microcontroller. I'm not gonna say more about this, but look forward to Nuno and Jaime's presentation coming up later in this, um, uh, later in this uh, conference. So, one final thought for me on things in the ROS community that might be valuable to be able to be leveraged is that there's a lot of tools for packaging. This is something that the ROS community spent a lot of time on, as well as the greater Linux and open source communities. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there, and I think that considering leveraging these things would um, be great to uh, facilitate more uh, collaboration with the community. So to finish this up, I'd like to put a challenge back to you. Um, I've listed a lot of things in the ROS community that I think would be valuable for you. And I'd like you as the PX4 community to think about what are some of the things in your community that might be valuable to the greater robotics community um, that you could share and increase the number of people with which you're um, collaborating. Uh, as I talked about, we wanna to get to bigger, bigger communities, bigger systems. And so if we can have this co uh, collaboration go both ways, that would be great. Uh, just off the top of my head, there are great top-down mapping interfaces in the drone community, uh, as well as free space planners and potentially situational awareness tools and fleet management things that might be valuable for say boats or cars. Um, so think about what you're working on. Has someone else done something similar? Can you take advantage of what they're doing? And if you're doing something and you think someone else might be doing simpler, can you share what you're doing to let them take advantage of it? And as a last reminder, don't fall onto the not invented here trap. It can be something, it'll decrease productivity overall. And um, it can be counterproductive to forward progress. We can all do more if we work together. So. Thank you, everyone. And a couple of questions I see coming in. So uh, the Baylands Gazebo World uh, is asked where you can get it. Um, it's available in the default SIDL launches now, I believe. Um, we also are hosting it in the Gazebo Fuel repositories. So if you go to the standard Gazebo tools, uh, you should be able to download it from there as well. It's a standard built-in library with all the models are available in our online repository. So another question is compared to ROS1, how lightweight can ROS2 be? Um, I don't have a good metric answer to be able to give you this, but we are really targeting to be able to run down onto microcontrollers. Uh, there's more information from Nuno and Jaime that'll be coming up in a later talk. Um, but we, are, we can get down to a much, much lighter interface And third question, what is the fundamental need for ROS and why not just integrate ROS capabilities into PX4? So what is the fundamental need for ROS? The underlying thing that ROS is doing is mostly facilitating collaboration by providing standard interfaces for people to talk between as well as providing standard modules that people can interact, um, plug and play and swap out and do the collaboration. So if I write a SLAM module and you write a SLAM module, we're using the same interface and the same um, uh, different implementation, we can plug our different implementations into the system moderately easily using ROS packages and ROS launch files and the standard ROS interface. Why not just integrate ROS capabilities into PX4? Um, that's a great idea. I think that we are making good progress on getting that, going in that direction, being able to make the bridge between ROS and PX4 much, much smaller. And again, I'll refer you to Jaime and Nuno's talk coming up in a little bit. So, thank you. <laughs>